can social movements keep the social when they take over power and government? The example of Syriza, the Greek Progressive Alliance, has lessons to teach progressives. The movement for black lives is a case in point. Should it ever run candidates? And if not, what? Joining me this week, Irish author and scholar Helena Sheehan and Natalie Jeffers, one of the organizers behind Black Lives Matter in the UK. We'll also take a look at Stop and Frisk UK style, and I have a few words on right-wing bread and Trumpian circuses. I'm Laura Flanders. This is The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. At the cutting edge of both the austerity crisis and the alternative, the rise of the Greek left alliance Syriza a few years ago sparked progressive excitement around the world. What if, what if social movements on the left could successfully move into government? That bubble burst not long after Syriza actually took office. The next tremor to shake Europe came from the other direction with the momentous vote on Brexit, the vote in the UK to leave the European common market. Since then, elections have come and gone, more loom this summer. What is to be made of it all, especially when it comes to that sticky question of the relationship between social movements and government, and dare I say, power. I'm joined today by Helena Sheehan, author of a new book, The Series of Wave, Surging and Crashing with the Greek Left, and Natalie Jeffords, an organizer with Black Lives Matter UK and founder of Matters of the Earth, an education and design collective. Welcome both. Glad to have you. Thank, Thank you, Laura. So let's start with the book, Helena. Um, you call Greece a crucible. Um, a crucible of what? And what draw your interest to it? Well, I felt that uh, during the crisis, Series uh, showed all represented all the forces in motion at a really high energy level in, in confrontation with each other. Um, as you said, it was the cutting edge both of the crisis and of an, a possible alternative to the crisis. I think I got it from you. I think. And in the book. Uh, yes, well, <laughs> yeah. So that's what attracted me, and also the nature of series itself attracted me because I felt it represented. Uh, a best possible synthesis of the forces of the old left and the new social movements. Well, we'll get more into that, but take us back just a minute. I mean, we're going back to a period where um, austerity had been raging for a while. In, in your country, or adopted country of Ireland, um, there was an austerity scenario that people were said to be not resisting all that much, and Greece was held up as the great alternative of resistance. You say yeah. it's not that simple. No, definitely not. It was not true that Irish people didn't protest and weren't resisting. That makes me furious that so many people were saying and thinking that. But at the same time, uh, we looked to Greece and there was a higher level mm -hmm. of resistance that we did envy. We wished that we could have brought our level of protest uh, to that level. Uh, but the, the level of protest has been there from the beginning of the crisis and it's been very steadily rising. And even now when it's crashed in Greece, it's still rising in Ireland. Yeah. And, and what was your impression of all of this um, watching from, from the UK, Natalie? We had an immense amount of respect, as always, for the social movements, you know, that are happening within Ireland and inside of Greece. And I think Syriza were, was um, deeply inspirational for, for how that informal social movement power can actually penetrate the formal realms of power. So we'll talk a little bit about what your experience was, Helena, of actually going there, being in Greece for a lot of the key moments. You describe, well, you describe a fabulous, I would of course resonate with this, takeover of the public broadcasting channel, ERT. Want to talk was, about that? That was absolutely amazing. Well, I mean, there were just all of these forms of protest and resistance, and then these prefigurative projects. And some of them were in planning for a long time, and other ones just happened like that. This was a day in uh, June 2013 uh, where it wasn't part of my plan for the day, but in mid-afternoon there was an announcement by the government that they were taking the national public broadcaster, the equivalent of BBC. Or PBS or, in the US. Or, exactly. Taking it off air that very day at midnight, which was 
an absolutely shocking thing. Can you imagine if it was the BBC? Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. an absolutely shocking thing to do. So they were calling people to come to the station and uh, to demonstrate and, and to resist it. So the austerity government was saying, enough with this public broadcasting, we're yeah. pulling the plug. Yeah. And the movement, yeah. Syriza and the others, brought people to protest. And then well, what happened next? It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't just... Um, it wasn't just that, it was actually uh, to meet Troika targets of um, eliminating public sector jobs and to take out the whole public broadcaster meant, you know, 2,000 some in a go. So that was a lot of what it was about. Actually, you know, Eric wasn't as resistant as it should have been, but it became very resistant. Uh, against the government and against Troika rule on that day. And for a while they were playing amazing stuff. It was amazing. It was Well, first of all, on the day, there were thousands of people there singing these traditional Greek songs of resistance in the open air, and, and then there was broadcasting still going on. It wasn't so much series as series as part of the larger Greek left, uh, and even the Greek people beyond the left. There was massive resistance um, to the closure of Eret. And uh, so we had this expectation that at midnight the riot police would come and these thousands of people would, I don't know, get, you know, either get tear gassed actually and, and somehow they would forcibly take over the station. That didn't happen. Um, what happened was they closed down the mass, uh, but Eric continued broadcasting originally uh, with the support of the EBU, the European Broadcasting Union, with, you know, various channels on the internet and other Greek channels. The Communist Party had its own channel and rebroadcast Eret on it. So they continued to broadcast for two whole years. Two whole years. The riot police did come some uh, some months later, yeah. uh, I mean, but they still continued to broadcast. I mean, it really, I, I, it stuck with me just as one example, and there were many, of the kind of thing you sort of see in a movie and you wish would happen. You've been part of some mo experiences like that too, Natalie, in your Black Lives Matter work, where you had that feeling of wow, this is the way we could move into a different kind of future. Definitely the Black Lives Matter network um, and the movement is a reimagining and visioning project. You know, us looking at the world that we were born into, the one that we inherited and the one that we want, and one that's inclusive of, of LGBTQI community, you know, putting black, brown, indigenous leaders at the forefront, looking at what it means when we centre our voice. We always say there's nothing new under the sun, there's, there's nothing that we're saying that hasn't been done by others or hasn't been done by our ancestors, but we definitely have some new tools and new ways of connecting that's allowing us to sort of push those boundaries yeah. a little bit more. So very much so some of the direct actions that we have done and the strategy that we've been building has been um, really innovative and has had um, been able to shake the foundations of some mm. of the traditional spaces you know so shaking the foundations a lot of people that eventually got involved in the series alliance were foundation shakers but then they find themselves going into those big old buildings um, taking over government uh, getting elected put it that way that was actually what happened what happened next um, they had me convinced, I, I was seriously convinced uh, before that election that they had really assessed the balance of forces and had a really coherent negotiating strategy and would really put up a fight to keep the promises that they made. Um, they did intend, you know, to keep those promises, but I don't think that they had it as well worked out as I believed uh, before that election. How so? Uh, they were up against overwhelming power and they had every reason to know they would be up against overwhelming power. Um, I think that they were right to negotiate within the Eurozone, but I think that to do that effectively um, they had to suspend debt repayments mm -hmm. so that they could pay salaries and pensions and all the things that they promised to do, not only you know to reverse the cuts of the previous government, um, I think they, they should have done that immediately while still, you know, um, trying to work out some sort of compromise within the Eurozone. But those things were the sine qua non to taking control um, of their own economy, which meant taking control of their own lives. Mm. But not easy. I mean, I remember talking to people from Syriza who said it was like trying to recreate the plane while you were flying midair. It was. Of course it was. Mm -hmm. But of course it was. But, you know, that, that's what we're all up against. You know, we have a system that's evolved this far. Uh, we have forces in motion. 
um, were attempting to set things on a new trajectory. They made radical promises to set things on a new trajectory and did intend to, um, but, you know, collapsed under the weight. I mean, the force that was exerted yeah. against them was massive and it was brutal, yes. but that still doesn't excuse capitulating yeah. to it. So what's the lesson that you draw and that other people, your colleagues who have studied this situation draw from what happened there in Greece? And then obviously I'm interested in what lessons do you, the social movements that you were part of, Natalie, draw specifically with respect to the elections and so on ahead in the UK? To assess the balance of forces, um, to anticipate the moves that will be made against you and be ready to put up a lot more of a fight than they did in the end. And uh, they conceded too much too soon in the negotiations. Um, they took the negotiating power away from themselves by not being prepared for Grexit. I mean, Grexit is a very different thing from Brexit um, because in Greece it was only in, in the first instance exiting from the euro currency to begin to take control over the economy, not necessarily the EU, though they were you know, very well aware that they could be forced into that position. Mm -hmm. But it's a very, Brexit is a very different thing than Brexit. Uh, um, primarily the, um, the impetus came from the left and from, you know, taking control of the economy to then to begin to engage in radical redistribution of wealth. Whereas with Brexit, it was a different, it was, it was people wanting to take control mm -hmm. over their lives all right, but it was animated by different forces and it was more balanced to, to the right than to the left. Mm -hmm. Although, you know, the whole issue of the EU is very complicated because both right and left are on both sides of it. Right. And so it's very complicated. But complicated and just even what you just described, on the one hand, needing to anticipate the, the balance of forces and the threats against you, but it was the threats against them that were exactly the reasons they gave for why they did the capitulation that they did. So assess them differently and be prepared to stand up, yeah. is what I'm hearing. Yeah. Lessons for you, are there any? Black Lives Matter is non-party political. Um, we don't side with the right or the left because we're actually trying to find those alternative spaces. Um, so we uh, see ourselves at the level of grassroots organising and grassroots innovating. So I think that really um, the lessons learnt is how you can keep continue to put that pressure on the formal political power who will um, step in. So. You know, if that is the Labour government, which have finally decided to go back to the roots of Labour mm -hmm. and actually write a pretty radical manifesto, you know, pretty socialist in its core, um, and to say, look, we're not playing the centre ground anymore. This is what it's about. And actually, this is what's needed in order to fix the last eight years of austerity measures from the Tory government. So um, for us, it's how we can be using a multitude of strategies and techniques at a community level. Um, so we have started a campaign, Come What May, where we are building with local communities around what they need and what their, the main issues are that they face. So we can look at building this hyper-local strategy that we then connect nationally. Would it ever be conceivable that somebody might run on a Black Lives Matter platform for office? Would you, if you were asked, ever serve in government? No. Think? Talk about that. Um, again, I could have predicted what was going to happen with Cereza because of y y you. I think you have to have a space inside the formal, um, and your voice needs to be heard. But you don't have to be there permanently and take that title and 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 fit into that hierarchy with all of those. There's so many layers of bureaucracy that have been built over time to cause violence and to, to, to keep power for people. You are not going to be able to chip away at that. So I don't believe the in the reformist approach to, to, to government. You talk sense. about balancing yeah. this kind of I, about governmentalism, yeah. I think you call yeah. it, and governmentophobia. Yeah, yeah. Where well, do you fall down? Yeah, one, yeah one, of, one of the people I was uh, having conversations with series have put it that way, and I thought that was very astute. I think that it's important to um, see uh, the state as a, a site of struggle. Sure. And I think that state power, along with many other kinds of, uh, the struggle for state power, along with many other struggles, is, is very important to engage with. I think electoral politics is very important alongside all other kinds of, of protests and resistance and prefigurative projects. But the thinking in Greece was, and I agree with this myself, 
was that, you know, after all of these things and after all the general strikes and everything they'd done, really the range of, of protest and resistance and prefigurative projects was astounding. Yeah. Um, but, you know, everything, you know, continued, people's material conditions continued to decline mm. despite all of this. And so the thinking was that what would it take to, you know, shift this? onto a new trajectory, and it was to form a left government. And I think they were right. I agree with, I, I agree with that. I think they were right to attempt that. And I think that that has to be part of a strategy yeah. with, with many other strategies for, for all of Inside, us. Inside, outside, and everything in between. Absolutely. Exactly, and I agree. And I think that we have to be building. That's what, when we speak about, say, intersectionality and inclusivity, it's really how we're forming those connective points across the horizontal, the mm. vertical, the formal, the informal, making sure that we're making those connective points. But BLM pers and, and myself personally, don't, we don't need to take that role but we can support people who are in that role and support community members getting into those positions but one of the things we need to make sure is that we can stand in a space where we can actually hold those state powers and institutional powers accountable for what they're doing mm -hmm. and you're not necessarily you're not necessarily able to do that if you're inside of that space so don't so, just move all of your yes. social movements into government office no. leave some outside but to support those who who then will this be is those important voices. not to demobilize the wider so, movement yeah. that gave rise to a party that managed to, to achieve mm. left government this is true in mm. south africa with the anc mm. as well exactly. the anc as a movement the liberation movement kind of demobilized yeah, yeah. Um, and look to the ANC as a government to do everything for them. And this is one of the crucial things that so went wrong. So what's at stake in this election in the UK in the last minute we have mm. about left? Sorry. Mm. No, 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 I'm just going to say that actually I do think that um, because of Jeremy Corbyn's past... The head of the Labour um, Party. Uh, the, the, the head of the Labour Party, yeah. Because of... Um, the way that he actually sees the strength of grass movement, the grassroots movements and social movements, we believe that he um, will be somebody that you can negotiate with and hold accountable to. And so what's really interesting, and I think, is that their stance on mental health and that, that that's one of the greatest threats to our societies, and they're addressing that in their manifesto. One of the things that they haven't addressed is a relationship between mental health and state-sanctioned violence and the police. So for us, that's a way of us had then having that conversation to say, we completely agree and support the work that you're doing on mental health, particularly in the LGBTQI and B, um, black and people of colour communities. But you're missing that intersection and actually how can you deal with that problem when you're not addressing mm -hmm. the deportations and the refugee centres and the and the prisons and the care homes where people who have a mental health episode are then um, disproportionately, um, they, they have uh, an extortionate amount of uh, threats and violence that are brought against and by the state instead of support and care which is what a socialist government should be doing is providing that instead. Fantastic talking to both of you. I could keep going, doing it for hours. Thank you so much. The book by Helen, Helena Sheehan is The Serious Wave Surging and Crashing with the Greek Left. It's just out from Monthly Review Press. Thanks for coming into the program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Natalie, in your capacity with Matters of the Earth, you've got a video you want us to take a look at, having to do with Stop and Frisk. This is a video which looks at um, how parents and carers can speak to children about Stop and Search or Stop and Frisk here um, in order to break some of the stigmas associated with it. Again, similar to here, there's a disproportionate number of black, brown, particularly Muslim um, children who are being stopped on the streets by police and this film is a way to get the parents and the child to speak with each other around this um, and it also comes with a guide that you can download and with pull outs that you can put on your fridge so it's always there mm. so you can have that conversation at any point. We'll take a look there's more information at our website. Stop and search is a police power that allows officers to stop, detain and then search a person on the street. Between 2009 and 2013, over one million children were stopped and searched. My name is Carol and this is my son Niall. I've been stopped by the police 10 to 15 times. 
The first time it was when I was 11 years old. They stopped me and asked why I looked so happy. It made me feel scared. It was like my whole perception on the police had changed. I went home and told my mum straight away. I was really shocked because for me it signalled the end of his childhood. Stop and search can have a deep psychological impact on children, creating anxiety for their loved ones and building tension between the police and the community. I feel I'm not able to hang out in my home area as there is a history of conflict between the police and the community. Hi, my name is Neymar and this is my son Adnan who didn't wish to be filmed. Um, one day Adnan came home. He was uh, visibly shaken up and upset. I asked him what had happened and he explained that he'd been stopped and searched by the police. He found it a humiliating and degrading experience because of the way that him and his friends were shoved around by the police. I asked if he was doing anything he shouldn't have and he said, no, mum, he said, like, why do you always take their side? And I'd never had any interactions with the law myself, so I always assumed they were the good guys. He, he became more closed off and it was the start of a long and um, hostile relationship with the police. Although the use of stop and search has decreased, it is still disproportionately used against black and minority ethnic children. The last time that Nile was stopped by the police, I was in the car with Nile and he gets out before me to make his way to the house. As he does so, a police car stops and I see that the police are talking to him. I get out of the car quickly and they, having seen me, stop what they're doing and drive off. So I ask Nile, what was going on there? And he tells me, oh, apparently there's been a robbery in the area and Niall fits the description. I feel really angry about the way young people are treated. Our children deserve to be treated equally, fairly and appropriately by all the adults they meet, including the police. When a child under 18 is arrested and taken into custody, there are safeguards to protect them because of their age. But in the street, officers can stop and search children without anyone else to hold them accountable. Adnan was uh, 13 or 14 the first time he was stopped and searched by the police. If Adnan's first interaction with the police had been a positive one, the path could have been different. It was very difficult to reach out to Adnan because he, he seemed to be carrying around a lot of resentment and a lot of anger. And um, as a parent, you feel powerless. At that time, I'd, I wasn't aware of any help or assistance. You do feel like you're alone, I suppose. The only time you do feel that you're not alone is when you interact with other parents who are going through similar experiences. Stop and search can be a disempowering and intimidating experience for young people and can have a serious impact on parents and communities. For more information, go to stopwatch.org to download our parent guide. If you are a young person, visit whystop.org or you can download our app. Just when you thought corporate ethics couldn't get any creepier, there is news that some of the country's largest companies are spending big money to stop we the public from being able to fix their faulty products. You heard that right. So-called right to repair laws are pending in nearly a dozen states, including New York. They'd require electronic companies, for example, to sell replacement parts and tools and make repair guides available to the public. Makers oppose repairs. They'd rather just sell us all new stuff or force us to sign up for their proprietary replacement parts and costly service programs. Apple, Verizon, Lexmark, Medtronic, even Toyota and Caterpillar are among the corporations who are going all out to squash right to repair legislation. Vice has a whole beat following the dispute on their motherboard blog. The right to repair spat caught my eye because I'm a tinkerer, first of all. From old cars to old lamps, I love cracking open a piece of broken machinery, studying how it works and getting it functioning again. It beats throwing it away and not just for pocketbook reasons. Computers have already made the tinkerer's life harder. Software is patented, laws forbid unlicensed repairs, landfills are filling up with toxic components and hard plastic cases. 
that would be reason enough to pay attention. But there's also the David versus Goliath aspect. According to New York State's Joint Commission on Public Ethics, the company's spending is dwarfing their opposition by thousands of dollars to one. And the last standout part of this is what it reminds us about capitalism. Corporate-driven media and captured politicians have taught generations of us that businesses just want freedom from. Freedom from taxes, from regulations, limits, you name it. But what they really want is freedom too to control the very government they mock. They're not against government, not if they own it, which takes us to something even creepier. You may have heard that the Trump budget would slash some $72 billion from services for disabled people, including those injured on the job and their kids. The cuts amount almost exactly to what just one corporation, Apple, is offshoring to avoid paying taxes. $72 billion in cuts versus $75 billion in Apple's offshored accounts? Corporate ethics is a contradiction in terms. Maybe it's time to retire the phrase altogether.